We are looking at a life reset and what it takes to have a life reset. And a few weeks ago we began by looking at the preparation one needs to take before they have a life reset. Uh, you begin to, by asking God to do something new in, new in your life. I want to do something new. We never ask God for that. Have we ever asked God, gee, what, what new thing do I need to change in my life? Maybe he has a different plan for you that maybe you need to be on. Um, then pinpoint specifically what needs to change. You need to ask other people for support for, for the reset and then eliminate those things that short circuits that reset. Then the last couple of weeks we looked at our mind. We have to look at change, making changes uh, by making choices. We're going to change by making choices. Those choices begin in our minds. Everything begins in our minds. Our mindset has to change. Carl read uh, Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can become a new person. And we're going to talk, we, we talked in depth about that. We're going to reemphasize some things this morning. But your choices shape your life far more than your circumstances. There are, and I shared with you three reasons to, to begin to change the way in which you think about your life and your mindset and three choices for resetting that mindset. This morning, we're going to actually dig in and talk about the hard choices because you're going to have to make some hard choices. If you want to change something in your life, usually we change something that we already have mastered but we, we slip on from time to time. Oh, I need to cut back on my coffee. But you have mastered that. So drinking, drinking coffee or not drinking coffee is not a big deal to you. But that's not a major life change. There are things that are hurting your life. It's hurting your behaviors, hurting your relationships. It's hurting, it's hurting your job. It, it, it just, it's a stumbling block. To change that means you have to have some hard choices. You may have to make some hard choices to those changes. Making the hard choice. It, true or false? If there's an easy way or a hard way to do it, which way do you rather do it? It's not always, it may not always be the prudent way to do it the easy way. It may not be the thorough way to do it the easy way. But as I've discovered in my, in my sewer line, thanks to, to uh, Jim and, and others, um, Water flows where there's least resistance. Wherever there's a resistance, it finds a different way to go. And I think it's true in our lives. It's hard to make those choices. We'd rather not be inconvenienced. We, we, we don't want to <clears throat> work that hard. So how, we, how do we go about making those hard choices? You, some of you may have some persistent problems you can't get rid of. Some of you have tried over and over again to try to change some things to no, to no avail. And that's because the choices that we're making are difficult. So I want, to con I want, I want us to consider this morning two very important questions. First question is this. Why is it so hard to change some of the stubborn areas of my life I don't like about me. Why is it so hard to change some of the stubborn areas in my life that I don't like about me? The second question is this, what does God say it takes to change them? We keep asking the first question and sometimes we struggle with the second question. So we're going to look at why it's difficult to change some shortcomings in our lives and we're going to look at how to do it, okay? So we're going to take a few moments 
Why is it so hard to change some shortcomings in my life? Why is it so hard to change that? And you could probably answer those in your mind. Maybe you're answering them now. It's this or this. It's uh, I like it or you know it's not important. Or you can go through that. I picked out four I think that's important for us this morning. Why is it so hard? Because I've had them for such a long time in my life. They've been with me for like forever. Listen, you didn't get to where you are today overnight. Some of, some of you woke up this morning, you, ha, you still have the same major problems you had 20 years ago. You didn't just wake up with it. It has developed over a period of time. It has taken you time and hard work to become as messed up as you are. <laughs> okay? Let's face that truth, right? So, guess what? You can't turn a switch and change it automatically. It's taking a long time, maybe years. In fact, some of these problems probably helped you cope at one time or another in your life, particularly if you're a small child. Children don't know how to cope, so they create coping mechanisms. But over the years, those coping mechanisms become self-defeating problems in your life. And we don't know how to deal with it. You've had them for, hey, this is my best buddy. I can't just shove that problem out. I've had them for such, such a long time. Today, you know they don't work for you anymore, though. It, maybe, maybe in my case, in, in my life, anger was an issue. It took me a long time to recognize anger was an issue in my life. Why was it an issue in my life? Because when I was a child, when I was four or five years old, um, my parents divorced. And if you, if you ask my mother, I took her to my dad's girlfriend's house. I knew how to get there. How does a three or four year old cope with that? You become a people pleaser, and then when you become a people pleaser, you get angry a lot because things aren't going your way. And then as you become an adult, this coping mechanism you brought with you. you are you following what I'm saying? It's self-defeating. You hang on to them because it's an old friend. You've had them such a long time. It's comfortable, but you know it needs to change. Another reason that we have difficulties changing our shortcomings is because we identify with them. That's our identity. It becomes who we are. We often confuse our identity with our shortcomings. We say, you know, I'm a workaholic. Oh, I'm just a passive person. Or... I'm the one who has to take the initiative. Complete this sentence. Now, don't, don't, don't complete this out. Don't say it out loud because you probably don't want anybody to know it, okay? Keep it to yourselves. Complete this sentence. It's just like me to be... And answer that question. Now, answer, say that question over again ten times. It's just like me to be. It's just like me to be. And at the end of those, you will find out what you are. There's one thing, will, one thing will stand out. And by the way, guess what? Other people probably already know it, and you ju you're just finding out. When we see ourselves in certain ways, we set ourselves up for self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm a workaholic. Therefore, I work all the time. I have to. That's who I am. Right? <laughs> there are shortcomings. These shortcomings are hiding who we truly are, though, and who we should be. You understand? It's okay to be diligent about working. There's nothing wrong with that. But not at the expense of other people. Not at the expense of ruining your own health. We fear that if we change 
will no longer be who we think we are. So do something, so, so some things are hard to change because we've had them such a long time. Some things are hard to change because we identify them. It's, even though we know it's self-defeating, but sometimes we, we have a hard time changing because my patterns have a payoff. Listen to me. Your patterns have a, has a payoff. You get rewarded for your shortcomings. At four or five or six, there was a certain, there was a certain reward that I must have gotten to keep going. Otherwise, but, 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 let me just back up. Your behavior, you do what you're rewarded to do. I don't know how to say that very well. Your behavior depends on the rewards you get for what you do. So whatever bad behavior you're having, somewhere along the line, you're getting rewarded for it. If you know somebody that's, that's very domineering, and they shouldn't be, and you know that's a, a personal uh, a, a shortcoming in their lives, they must be getting a reward somewhere along the way. There's a payoff. What's in it for me? Syndrome. Good, bad, healthy or unhealthy. There's some sort of payoff somewhere. We don't continue to do things that we're not rewarded for. So even if I'm doing something unhealthy, unhelpful or self-destructive, there's a payoff. Any negative behavior being repeated by ourselves or by others always have a payoff. Think about it. There's something, even if it's temporary, even if it's not big, there's a payoff. But there's a, there's a fourth one that I want to talk about. And it, and it is not the Flip Wilson syndrome, okay? Sometimes it's because Satan discourages me. Satan discourages me. Now, this is not the devil made me do it. That's Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. That's Flip Wilson. Okay? The devil can't make you do anything. But he can discourage you. He can suggest to you. He can tempt you. He can... T the S Satan, the Bible says, he's the great accuser. He wants to keep you down. He wants to put you in a rut. You know what a rut is, right? A rut is as a deep hole with the sides kicked out. It's a grave with the sides kicked out. That's where he wants to place you. You think you're moving forward. All you're doing is you're in a grave. You just don't realize it. He wants you there. He wants you discouraged. He has these negative suggestions for your life. You can't change. This is who you are. This is your identity. You've had this all your life. And look at the payoff. Think about Adam and Eve. Your eyes will be open and you will know like God knows. How'd that work out for us? Right? There's a pay. He is the great accuser. He uses your self-doubt. He uses your deficiencies to say, you can't climb out of this hole. You can't do this. You have to change your mindset. You can't change your mindset. It's already, that's why it's called a mindset. It's already set. You can't do anything about it. That's baloney. So what does it take to change? And more importantly, what does God say it takes to change? Because there's, there's some biblical principles that we can use to get that discouragement, that, occur, that accuser out of our brain. Okay? Does, he's not going to go away forever. He's going to continue to battle with you. But there's some things we can use. And I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4. It's in your bulletin. We've, we've been in Ephesians chapter 4 from the very beginning. And we'll be, probably stay there for a long time. But Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 21. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, I'm going to pause. If there's somebody in here that doesn't know Jesus, I want to talk to you. Carl and I both want to talk to you. But we want to talk to you. 
Because nothing starts um, changing the mindset than getting to know Jesus. Now the rest of you, if you know Jesus, since you have heard about Jesus and you have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature in your formal way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, in other words, change. Instead, let the Spirit renew your, your feelings, renew your behavior. Is that what the Bible says? Paul says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on, a new, put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Oh, I'm a truthful person. Except to yourself. Except to yourself. So stop telling yourself lies. Stop telling your neighbors lies. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all, we are all part of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're, you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So what does it take to have lasting change? Four biblical principles for lasting change. Lasting change requires learning and facing, learning and facing the truth. We have difficulties learning the truth. We have even more problems facing it. Change always starts with the truth. You can't have positive change on negative ideas. You cannot have positive change with mistruths. There are two important parts to this. Learning the truth and facing the truth. Proverbs 23, 23, learn the truth and never reject it. Learn the truth and never reject it. What's the opposite of reject? Accept, right? How do we accept? We have to face it. When we don't face it, what are we doing? We're rejecting it. Learn the truth and never reject it. You've got to learn. You've got to face it. You've got to accept it. Many people have learned a great many truths, but they fail to acknowledge it and they fail to face it. The secret to lasting change is not willpower. It is not rest. It is not pills. It is not resolutions. It is not chemics. It's knowing and facing the truth about yourself. About God. About life. About problems. So the first problem is, what if I don't do that? What if I don't want to do that? Why don't we want to learn and face the truth? Because the truth is often uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Someone once says the truth will set you free, but first it makes you miserable. I don't know who said that. I borrowed it from somebody else, I'm sure. The truth will make you free, but first it will make you miserable. It's often painful to face the truth about yourself. Always hated evaluation times in the Air Force. They never talked about things that were good. They always talked about things that were bad. Think about evaluations. How often do people praise you and reward you for what you did good? It makes you very uncomfortable to find out some truths about yourself. We would rather stay deluded, living in our mystical fairyland where everything is happy. We just prefer to live there. Even though everything is not happy, we enjoy living in the land of denial, knowing the truth without facing the truth. Isaiah 30 verse 10 says, Tell the prophets to keep quiet. Let's, let's stop right there. The word prophet. Are you following me? Teacher, prophet, um, messenger. Are we okay with the word messenger? 
Some, some versions uses the word messenger. They tell their, the messenger, they tell the prophets to keep quiet. They say, don't talk to us about what's right. Tell us what we want to hear. Let us keep our illusions. Who is God's messenger in your life? Who's God's messenger in your life? Obviously, in the Old Testament, God chose who would speak to him. We had prophets. We had judges. We even have a donkey that spoke for God, right? Say yes. Really? A donkey? Yes. A donkey. I was going to use the other name, but I figured somebody would be upset about that. Somebody start pointing fingers. So, Therefore, God can use anyone in your life to be a messenger for you. Get this. God could even use an unsaved, unbeliever, unchristian person in your life to be his messenger. Really? If he can use a donkey, he could let the rocks cry out if he wanted to. God is able to suggest words in their mouth to speak to you. However, anytime we don't want to hear something, it's our nature to create some sort of barrier or some sort of excuses. You heard the phrase, out of the mouth of babes? Parents, I think, would be very, very wise sometimes, sometimes listen to what their kids say about them, to say about you, about their parents. We don't like what we hear sometimes. But that child may be a messenger from God. And, and, and if you're a child, or if you're a teenager, you're a young adult, you might want to listen to your parents. That parent may be a messenger from God. That boss you can't get along with, that heathen, pagan boss that you just don't like, may be, and not, we're not talking about Jim, it's Dee Dee. He, they, that may be the he, may, that may be God's messenger. The truth about you and me, there is there's a truth, and I want you I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say right now. Listen to me. The truth about you and me. This is truth. You may not want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you, tell it to you anyway. We're all broken. We're all broken. I'm sorry if that makes you feel bad. I don't mean to make you feel bad. But the truth is we're all broken. You're broken. I'm broken. That is the truth. Are we going to face that? We all sin. We, ha we are all imperfect. We have, def we have defects. And we have flaws. We see, we see it in other people, but we deny it in ourselves. Jesus was talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus tells Nicodemus this. Listen carefully, I'm speaking sober truth to you. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. We need to listen to the truth. And the truth is that we're, we're all sin sinners. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. We like verse John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us of sins, cleanse it from all unrighteousness. What's 8 says? If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. Are you sinners? Say yes. You are a sinner. You are flawed. You are broken. Are you a good person? Probably. You try to do good things? Likely. But you're still broken. You all, you all, we all fall short. Here's an important truth. Behind every self-defeating defect is a lie that I'm believing. Do I need to say that again? Behind every self-defeating defect is a lie I'm believing. It's a lie. That's why it's self-defeating. I'm believing a lie about hopelessness. And what brings happiness? I'm believing a lie about God and what He's really like. I'm believing a lie about myself. I'm believing a lie about my past. I'm believing a lie about my future. I'm believing a lie about myself. I believe, I'm believing a lie about other people in my life. I'm believing a lie about what is real success. 
I'm believing a lie about what's going on in my life right now, what's going on in my life in the future, my past, my failures. I'm believing a lie about all of that. And this is why the first requirement for personal change to reset your life is to learn and face the truth about ourselves. More about myself, about yourself. Learning to face the truth is the most loving thing you can do for yourself. Let me say that again. The most loving thing you can do for yourself is to start facing, learning and facing the truth. It's the most loving thing you can do for other people in your life. And listen to this. It's the most important thing you could do for a loving God. Ephesians 4.15, which we did not read. Love should always make us tell the truth. Then we will grow in every way and be more like Christ. So where do I find the best truth for me? Where do you find the best truth for you? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Where do we find the best truth for our lives? Right here. Right here. Not on Fox News. Not on CNN. Not from some government, government agency who's here to help us. I'm not getting political, I'm just telling the truth. Here is the best truth for your life, right here. So when it comes to personal change, it's important for us to look at the Bible because it is the manual for resetting our lives. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures inspired by God is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. If I stop right there, that's all I need to say. Get in God's Word. But it doesn't stop there. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare, to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Lasting change requires learning and facing the truth. Lasting change requires new thinking. New thinking. This is something we went over the last two weeks. I had to break it, that, that, that passage. I, I, I just didn't have time to put everything I wanted to say in one message. I broke it up in two. My problem is you probably won't put those two messages together when you should. It's about having a different mindset. But even though we went over it, I want to emphasize some of the key points. And actually the key point. The key point is this. Don't get confused. But listen to it carefully. You aren't what you think you are. But what you think you are. Oh, that's kind of play on words there. You're not who you think you are, but what you think you are. It's a battle for, uh, for change that is won or lost in your mind. If you look at our text, Ephesians uh, 4.23. Instead, let the Spirit renew, change your thoughts and attitudes. Here's, how, here's how, how it works. Okay, look at this. Okay, you think, therefore you are. You think. Your emotions, your attitudes, everything, your feelings, whatever. That's where it starts. And you, as you begin to think, it influences your feelings. You begin to feel based on what you thought. And as we begin to feel, then we begin to act. We begin to do those things in our behavior. So, if you have a lie in your brain which creates an emotional response within you, your actions will not be true. It won't be healthy. You understand? And here's our problem. We try to change our feelings. If I would just feel different, I'll make a resolution to feel different. That doesn't work. Why? Because that's not where it starts. Where it starts is you, if you're going to change the way you do things, you've got to go back, back to your thinking. 
Do you see the process? We think, therefore we become, we get this feeling, and then we act upon that feeling or that emotion. And you say, well, pastor, I'm not a feely sort of guy. In, in the um, Meyer Briggs um, personality conflict, uh, co uh, um, personality profiles, they have thinking and feeling. More men tend to be thinkers, more women tend to be feelers, only by about one percentage point. Not, you know, just, it's almost 50-50. This is not about that. Do you have a brain? Anybody who don't have a brain, raise your hand. It's, you have to be a teenager. You have to be a teenager, right? And he's half right. Anyway, if you have a brain, okay, you can think. Think about your emotions. Where to begin? In your heart, your bowels, or up here? You see where I'm going? Some sort of response triggers something. Your brain triggers something, a feeling, an emotional response, something you say, I've got to act on. We act on it. But if you're going to change the way you act, you've got to go back to change the way you think. Now listen, there's a biblical process for changing the way you think. Follow me. There's a biblical word, there's a theological word, there's a simple word that describes this process of changing the way you think. It's called repentance. That is the Bible process, the biblical process for changing your mind. The Greek word for this is a compound Greek word, and if I pronounce it, I'm going to mess it up. But the first part of it is meta. The second part of it is mind. Noia. Metanoia. Basically, it means to change your mind. It literally means change your mind. The English word that we use for changing our mind is the word repentance. It's repentance. And repentance doesn't mean what you think it means. So much of the time we say, we're sorry. That is not repentance. You may be sorry for your actions, but what are you doing to change it? You see where I'm going with it? You're sorry for your actions. You wish it hadn't been done. You, you have remorse. But are you changing the way you think? That got you there in the first place. Philippians 2.5 says, In your life you must think and act like Christ Jesus. So let me point out a couple of things about your shortcomings. Your shortcomings are often strengths that are being misused. You have a shortcoming of some sort. Your shortcomings are actually probably strengths being misused. What do I mean by that? If your strength is discernment and it's being misused, you're likely to be judgmental about everything. If your strength is being, being a detailed-oriented person but it's being misused, you're likely to be picky, controlling, and difficult to please. If your strength is seeing the big picture, and if you're misusing that, you're tempted to be, or overlook people and run them right over because of the big picture. If your strength is being admirable, you, people just like you, and, being mis, and it's being misused, you're likely going to be, you're probably going to let people run right, right over top of you. You see how a strength can become a shortcoming and a shortcoming becomes weak? So let's, let's look at ourselves truthfully. The other, the other statement is, is your shortcomings are often attempts to meet your unmet needs. Again, we're back to the payoffs, right? Now, every need that you have are probably somewhat legitimate. If you're attempting to get your need met the wrong way, that becomes the problem. Everybody has a need for respect, right? Everybody has this need to be respected. But if you don't get respect, you go out of your way to try to get attention instead. Everybody has a need to be loved, but if that need's not met, you throw yourself 
at people in all the wrong ways. Everybody has a need to be valued, but if you don't feel that need to be met, you're going to talk too much. Everybody has a need to be secured, but if you don't let God meet that need, you're going to try to control everything in your life. Your shortcomings are often strengths being misused, and your shortcomings are attempt to meet unmet needs. We come to the third point, the biblical requirement. Lasting change requires community and coaching. We're not going to get healthy by ourselves. You know how I know that? Because you're not doing it now. I'm not doing it now. We are better together. God looked down at Adam and says, Hey, there's no suitable helpmate. Helpmate. There's no suitable helpmate for Adam. There's no suitable person or thing to have community with or coaching with. So he created Eve. We need other people around us. No, I don't. I'm, I'm a lone ranger. No, you're not. You, need t you also need Tonto. Well, I'm a private person, Pastor. And you know what? You might need things that need, you may have things in your life, but those are private things. You don't want to share it with anybody else. You don't want to share your dirty laundry, right? That's our excuse. So guess what? You, 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 you're determined to do it by yourself. But that could be why you're not making any headway, right? Right? And why? Because we need the help of other people in our lives. There are things you just never going to be able to do or change in your life on your own. There are some things so big you need help tackling them. We got two football games going on today. Seldom, seldom, now occasionally you have an open field tackle and the guy goes, well, that was a great open field tackle. But more, more, more times than not there's more than one people helping to take down somebody in a tackle. And sometimes our problems are we need somebody to help. We need other people to help us. This is why our Bible study groups, our Sunday school classes, our small groups are so important. And this is why it's important for us to expand our small groups. Some, I, had, we, I, I was at a church once, and one teacher had like 35 people in his, in his class. And I, you know, I, I loved the man dearly. I loved him dearly. But I said, whatever you're doing, you need to multiply this. Whatever you're doing, you need to multiply this to have other groups. How can you be intimate with 35 people? How can you do that? Listen, it's okay if your Sunday school class has five, six, seven, or eight people in it. It's not okay if it's not growing. And about 15 or 16, you may want to say, hey, we need to separate our, not separate, we're gonna, we need to multiply this group to start over again and keep multiplying. Two, one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight. You get the picture, right? Eight becomes 16. This is why it's important for us to have the, these small groups because intimacy is found in a handful of people. Not just acquiring Bible knowledge, but exchanging information and hurts and changes. But sharing and challenging each other to grow and mature and change is what it's all about. Ephesians 4.25, part of our text. So you must, telling, you must stop telling lies. Tell each other truth. Tell each other truth. Because we all belong to each other in the same body. If you have, if, if, if somebody's having a, a personal crisis in their life, some, somebody's had this problem for the last 20 years, and this is a very intimate group, and they, they're, they're generally broken, and, and you know they're broken, and they want to change. And somebody says, well, are you willing to face the truth? Well, yeah. And you're willing to share that truth to that person. And when that person is crushed, are you willing to come around and build them back up and love them and, and help them change? Help them see and face the truth, not by themselves, but together. See how important it is? And some people think that a church of a small congregation has that. No, there's about 50 or 60 people here. But listen, it's the intimacy that we have in a small group. And sometimes 
Just in the one. Just in the one. Not everybody needs to know the stuff you're working on. But if you're serious about change, you've got to face the fear of sharing with somebody else. Look at Proverbs 28, 13. You will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Well, this is a problem. It's not a sin. What chances are to know what is right and not do it is what? The Bible says to know what is right and not do it is called what? To know what is right and not do it is called... You know you will never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Confess them and give them up. Then God will show, you mercy, show mercy to you. We, may, we waste an enormous amount of time and energy trying to cover up what everybody already sees anyway. Our biggest hurdle in growth is our desire to look good. And when you're in a community with a small group of people who are loving you, who are caring for you. They care for you unconditionally. They love you unconditionally. You're in this community, this tight-knit community. You know what? It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you look like. Because they love you. They care for you. Galatians 6.2 By helping each other with your troubles, you truly, truly obey the law of Christ. You need a community, but you also need a coach. Every professional athlete, did I say every? Every superstar athlete has a personal coach or trainer. Why? So they can get better. They need somebody to tell them what they're doing wrong so they can correct it and get better. Tiger Woods, and I, I, I don't have the dates, could have been 2003, I think he just won the Masters. I don't know that. Please don't hold me to the date. But after, after he finished the season with like, like, I don't know how many BGA titles, he went to his coach and they worked on changing his golf swing. That's unheard of. Here's a guy in his prime winning all of this money, winning all of these tournaments. He wins the Masters. What's he doing? He's going to change his golf swing because he thinks he can be better. Him and his coach worked on it all during the offseason. When he starts the season, he's not so good. But he continues to work on it. And by the end of that season, he won six major PGA events. And he's on his way again. Don't tell me we don't need a trainer or a coach. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. Is that biblical? Well, yeah, it's biblical. Joshua had Moses. Elisha had Elijah. David had Samuel and Nathaniel. Hey, Peter and John had Jesus. Timothy had Paul. Every Timothy needs a Paul. But listen to me. Every Paul needs a Timothy. Well, I don't know, so, I don't know somebody who's like Paul that's, that's spiritually mature that, that can coach me. All you need is one person one step ahead of you to coach you. That's all, that take, that's all it takes. Whatever your maturity level, you need to find a coach just one step ahead of you. That's all. You don't have to have somebody way out here. Just one step. That's all it takes. Community and coaching. I've got one more that I want to close with. Lasting change requires this thing, and this is so important, this is why I didn't want to leave it out. It requires the Holy Spirit in your life. Lasting change requires the Holy Spirit in your life. Well, I knew God was going to come, in, can come, come into the scene. He's all a part of it. It's not sooner or later. If He's not in the forefront, it's not happening for you. If you don't have Jesus in your life, it ain't going to happen for you. A life reset is not something you do on your own human energy. It's not something that a coach can help you with or a community can help you with. Only God can make those transformations in your life when the coach and community then becomes helpful to you. It's an internal change that requires the touch of the Creator Himself. Only Jesus can transform a life. Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of the Lord. You will not succeed by your own strength or, your, or by your own power, 
but by my spirit, says the Lord, all powerful. Everything pales if you don't have God's Holy Spirit. Do you understand? Lasting change happens when we face and learn the truth. Lasting change happens when we requires new thinking. Lasting change happens with community and coaching. Nothing that matters unless your Holy Spirit's in your life to help you do that. I'm not going to be able to transform myself into the likeness of Christ on my own. And neither can you. Desire is not enough. Willpower is not enough. My habits and my hang-ups didn't happen overnight, and it's not going to happen overnight, and they will not be eliminated overnight. It's going to take some time, but the Holy Spirit can work in your life. Paul says, and as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him. It's a gradual step forward and forward with incremental stages. And somebody once said this, God can grow a mushroom in six hours. But God takes 60 years to grow an oak tree. My question to you is, do you want to be a mushroom or do you want to be an oak tree? Do you want to be a mushroom or do you want to be an oak tree? I want to be an oak tree. I want God in my life. And I want Him working daily, all the time, while I reset my life. And I'm going to do so by learning and facing the truth. I'm going to work on changing my mindset. I'm going to be in a small community and have a coach. But I've got to start with the Holy Spirit in my life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us what it needs, what we need for a reset. These, making these hard choices. It is hard, Father, for us to face the truth about ourselves. We don't want to do it. We feel embarrassed and shameful. We feel naked when we are told the truth. But Father, your, that, that nakedness, that shame melts away when, we confront, when we're confronted with you and your love and your mercy. And Father, so help us to make the hard choices of facing and learning the truth, Father. And then help us with this mindset. Let us on a continual basis be repentant with, with uh, our, our thinking so it affects how we feel and how we act. Father, I pray also that we will be in community. A large community is a church for support, smaller communities for intimate taking care of. And, 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 and finding a coach is just one step ahead of me, Father, to, to help with this walk with you. But Father, if I don't have your Holy Spirit in my life, and I don't give him control of my life, nothing, of that, nothing else matters. So help me be an oak tree. One day at a time, grow me, use me, propel me into this great figure of Christ in his likeness. Father, there may be somebody here who's never had Jesus come into their life. And, and if... If you're listening to my words and you haven't asked Jesus in your life, you may want to pray this prayer. Father, I, I face the truth about myself being broken and a sinner, needing a Savior. I ask you to come into my life and save my life. I give you everything I have, everything I know to you, knowing that as I walk with you, I'll get to know you better and better and I can become an oak tree. If you prayed that prayer, you can become a child of God. Father, we thank you for this time. We give you our hearts, we give you our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stand, and we're gonna sing a song of invitation, a song of commitment. The, the altar's open. If you can't get to the altar, I, I urge you, to come to the altar. But you may not be able to get down to the altar. It, then make an altar right where you're at. But let not the distance and the bending down stop you from coming to the altar. If you've never had Jesus in your life, come and talk to me. During this time of commitment, during this time while people are singing, you come as we sing.